In the future, I believe we're going to send robots into outer space. And these robots are going to look more like this fly that you might find in your kitchen than like any one of us. Pretty surprising, right? How might these annoying little two millimeter long animals inform how we build robots? Well, like many of you, perhaps, I've always been fascinated by interstellar space travel. As a teenager, I'd visit the ocean at night with friends. We'd dip our feet in the water and look up at the stars and wonder if perhaps one day we might be able to visit some of the planets outside of our solar system. Unfortunately, this seems unlikely. In the short story titled, They're Made Out of Meat, two alien explorers remark at how amazing it is that humans can be so intelligent, we can communicate, we can even send radio signals. And yet, because we're made out of meat, we really can't travel very far in space. Now, this might be true, but today I want to convince you that perhaps we don't need to visit distant planets to see fascinating life forms on our own. And perhaps these life forms can actually teach us how to build better artificial intelligence and robots that can explore for us. So robots for exploration need to solve many challenges on their own. We might guide them with their own high-level objectives, but they have to make decisions and move through the world in an unknown and treacherous terrain. And researchers have been trying to make this possible for decades. Nevertheless, the, the abilities in terms of motor skills and decision-making of even state-of-the-art robots, they pale in comparison to even the simplest of animals. Take, for example, these flies that I had the pleasure of filming in a kitchen in Brazil. And, and don't worry, we didn't actually eat these bananas afterwards. To us, it might seem simple to go over these bananas, but to a fly, it has to go over deep crevasses and over giant stems, sometimes sideways, sometimes even upside down. And at the very same moment, males are searching for females to court with and mate with, and females are looking for egg-laying sites. And this ease by which animals like flies are able to explore their world has actually allowed these insects to colonize our planet hundreds of millions of years ago. They now make up the largest number of animal species and the largest animal biomass on the planet. And this may be annoying when you try to have a picnic on the beach, but it also makes them an ideal model, in my opinion, for actually inspiring the development of better artificial autonomous systems. So how might we actually figure out how the insect brain works? Well, figuring out how an animal brain works is the job of a neuroscientist like myself. And to illustrate how we go about doing this, I like to use the following metaphor. Imagine for a minute that you're sleeping calmly at night tonight, and you hear a crash in the backyard. You look up through the window, and you see this. So you have a UFO in your backyard, but you're also a very curious person, and you want to figure out how this UFO works. How would you reverse engineer this? Well, I would say there are three main approaches. The first one is to measure its behavior. Something that's shaped like a disc like this could fly like a Frisbee, but it might also roll like a wheel. You'd want to figure that out. Next, you'd want to open it up and see how wires transmit information from one part of the machine to the next, allowing it to behave. And finally, to really test the degree to which you understand this system, you might want to build a replica of it. So we're taking exactly these approaches in my laboratory to figure out how the fly brain works. And not just any fly, but a specific species known as Drosophila melanogaster. And as annoying as it might be that they invade your kitchen every summer, it actually has also made them an ideal model because it's very easy to raise them in the laboratory. And therefore, flies have been studied for more than 100 years. First, scientists tried to figure out how the genome works, how DNA actually organized the body of both animals as well as humans. And amazingly enough, it actually allowed researchers to build flies that have legs in place of antenna. It's pretty remarkable. And with this genetic targeting, we can actually also study neuroscience. Flies have thousands of times fewer neurons than most other animals that we study in neuroscience, including the laboratory mouse. And as well, we can target each of these neurons over and over again using genetics. Here, for example, I'm showing you the brain and motor system of a fly in purple. And in green, I'm showing you four neurons that descend from the brain down to the motor system to drive locomotion kind of walking. And we can target exactly these same four neurons over and over again across siblings' animals. 
This is impossible to do in more complicated brains, including those of laboratory mice. So now, using these genetic tools, we're trying to answer questions about how flies make decisions and how they move through the world. And as I mentioned with the UFO before, we start first by studying the animal's behavior. So now let's zoom in on a fly behaving. Here we see how it's grooming its head. And all that might have seemed simple at first, if you look closely, it actually requires the coordinated movements of the legs, the head, and the antenna. A lot of work just to prepare for a night on the town, right? But for this fly, it has to move these body parts in order to accomplish a specific behavioral task. Now, of course, if we want to quantify this behavior, we have to track the movements of each of these body parts. And you can imagine how boring it would be to actually have to tack in each single camera image each of the body parts. So what we've done in my laboratory is develop approaches using machine learning, allowing us to automatically track the movements of each of the body parts. Here, that's in the colored circles in the left image here. We can then reconstruct the 3D movements of each of the body parts to really know what the nervous system is trying to accomplish. OK, so now if you thought this was challenging to track behavior at this millimeter scale, the next challenge was much more complicated. How could we actually pop open the hood and look at how wires, the neurons in the fly's nervous system, transmit information from one part of the nervous system to the next to allow it to behave? This would require a micro-dissection approach to open up the back of the fly and use a microscope to visualize neural activity while the fly is behaving. And many people told me that this would be impossible. But after many attempts, and unfortunately for the flies, many failures, we finally managed to get this to work. We built then a microscope that then allows us to visualize the activity of these neurons. Here on the left, I'm showing you a fly that's behaving on a spherical treadmill or a floating ball. While it grooms and walks, you can see the neural activity in neurons or cells that control the front legs. These neurons become bright when they're active and dim when they're inactive. So we can not only record behavior at this millimeter scale, but we can also record neural activity at the micrometer scale in these tiny animals, allowing us to reveal how neurons drive the movements that we're observing. And not only that, we can record the same neurons over and over again in the same animal using another approach. We micro-engineered windows that we place on the back of the fly that allow us to peek inside the same animal over and over again, as you can see here on the bottom left. So we can measure behavior, we can measure neural activity, and even more impressively in the fly, recently groups across the world, including at Princeton and Cambridge and my own, have started to work on the fruit fly brain map and developed a full fruit fly brain map. And this is shown here. It's a landmark achievement allowing us to understand how each of the neurons connect to one another in the entire brain of the fly. And it's the most complicated brain map that currently exists. So now, using these different approaches, we can now start to address some of the fundamental and foundational questions in motor control. And to illustrate how we've done this, I'll give you one example from a recent paper that we published in Nature. And this question is as follows. How is it that the brain actually tells the body or motor system what it wants to do when it wants to, for example, walk or when it wants to groom? So previous work had suggested that the brain sends relatively simple commands given by these two green neurons passing down to the motor system. These simple commands are then transformed into complicated limb movements or body part movements. This is a bit akin to the idea of a doll, where you pull on a string in the back. As a string retracts, the doll might blink and speak, for example. However, when we recorded from these descending neurons coming from the brain to the motor system, what we found was that Actually, when the fly starts walking, many of these neurons become active all at once. And this is a very different model, something a bit more like a puppet with puppet strings, where each string controls individual joints or limbs, for example. So how might we actually reconcile these two seemingly contradictory models? Well, what we reasoned was that if we recorded these populations of neurons and stimulated these command neurons, we could see if they might actually be interconnected. So that's precisely what we did. We recorded populations of these descending neurons and then stimulated command neurons to drive walking or grooming. And indeed, what we saw is that these command neurons actually recruit these other descending brain neurons. And this suggested to us a completely new model for how the brain tells the motor system what to do. Something like a hierarchy, where at the highest level, you have descending neurons that provide the intention of the animal. 
to walk or to groom, for example. These neurons then directly connect with these lower level descending neurons that then actually control each of the body parts to execute the behavior. So this is really exciting for us because it provided really fundamental insight into how the brain drives movements, and it's likely to have impact on how we understand how the human brain drives our movements. And this is exciting, but of course you might be asking yourself now, how might we use this information to inform the design of artificial systems and robots? Well, we reasoned that the best starting point would be to build a digital twin of the fly. This could serve as a kind of test bed where we could take our biological algorithms and test them in a simulation. So to do this, we scanned the body of a real fly and imported it into a computer, digitized. We can now break apart each of the body parts and then reconstruct them into a natural pose. And now we can use artificial neural networks that are based on the real biological neural networks to test how well they perform in more complicated scenarios. For example, here we have the fly walking through an environment. We're testing how, how it gets perturbed by balls that are being thrown at it. And performs pretty well, it's quite stable. Of course, until there's too much of a perturbation, unfortunately. Don't feel bad for the fly, it's just a simulation. <laughs> but because it's a simulation, and not just an animation, we can also see what the fly sees and even smell what it smells. So in this next example, the fly is trying to find a hidden orange odor source behind these black pillar. And you can see what the left eye and the right eye see on the bottom, as well as how the odor intensity reaches each of the antenna. So I hope with this, I've convinced you that this simulation can actually serve as an excellent test bed for providing a bridge between biology and robotics, and really testing how well we understand how the fly's brain works. And I think this can have really important impact in two ways. First, I think that although flies may appear exotic, they actually share a lot of biology with you and I. Therefore, by understanding how the fly brain works, we can really accelerate an understanding of ourselves. And with this understanding, we can actually design artificial systems and robots that can decide and behave as well as flies can. So by reverse engineering the small but powerful brain of the fly, we might eventually better explore our own planet, other planets in our solar system, and possibly even beyond. Thank you. <laughs>